Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 113, we're going to go deep on phono preamps. We're going to talk about the RIAA or RIAA um, EQ circuit. We're going to talk about um, why it's important, how, how it gets equalized, and we're going to look at a couple of circuits as well as a prototype uh, phono preamp that's underway right now, or it's being, we're working on the design right now. We'll see how far we got along. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult the professional technician when in doubt. So, why can't we just plug a turntable into our amp and push play? Well, you could but the resulting sound would be awful. And the reason for that is records are mastered with a huge amount of EQ applied. EQ just stands for equalization. Let's look at some pretty pictures and see how all this works. Okay, so this is a, um, this is a, a plot of the equalization applied uh, at the mastering stage. That's before a record is pressed and the EQ applied to bring it back to a level signal. So the dotted line here, this is the mastering. This is what actually is on your records. So here is the center pole piece at 1000 Hertz. Nothing gets equalized at this point. There's your zero dB. Now take a look at the bass down here at 20 hertz. We're at minus 20 dB. That is a lot, folks. And over in the treble, we're plus 20 dB at 20 kilohertz. So to equalize this on playback, your preamp has to apply plus 20 dB in the bass region, and it has to drop 20 dB in the treble region. And at 1K, which is the very top of the mid-range, let's say, we don't need to do anything, right? Because you can see we're right where we're supposed to be. And after this EQ is applied, the signal will hopefully be, yep, you guessed it, will be flat. It never is perfectly flat, but it should be close. And then we're good. Okay, so that's what the equalization is. Now, why in the heck do they do this? Well, a, a, a stylus traveling in a record groove has a really hard time with the low frequencies. In fact, you can bounce the stylus right out. Mm -hmm. On top of that, the if you have a lot of bass in a recording, they have to widen the groove and give the stylus more room to cope with those low frequencies as it as the stylus traces its way along the groove. You can actually look up microscopic shots of record grooves, it's, it'll blow your mind. The longer the grooves are apart, the lower the note. Yeah, that makes sense. And of course, high frequencies are really close together, and there are a lot more of them. So the closer the grooves are together, the higher the frequency. Okay, so that explains why we drop the, the, um, the cutting of the record 20 dB in the bass region. Why the heck do we boost it? the treble 20 dB. Well, the reason for that is is simple. Siluses can follow um, high frequencies really easily in a groove and they're easy to press. On top of that, by boosting them 20 dB, boosting your treble 20 dB at the mastering stage, when you restore it to flat, you get an automatic noise reduction. And of course, if you're going to hear noise on a record, where is it going to be? It's going to be up in the higher frequencies normally. So getting a noise reduction into the treble region was a really good idea. And since I think roughly 1950, this the RIAA curve has been the standard for all records that have been pressed. There's some very minor variations that have been applied over the years, but essentially if your phono preamp reverses along this slope, then you're going to be good. Okay, let's look at some two very typical circuits. 
So the first is a passive equalization circuit. This is a classic circuit. It was published by RCA and I'm going to show you some RCA manuals that are really quite cool. If you're into development work you probably know about these and if you're not you should. So let's just back out a little bit. So this is called the RCA receiving tube manual. This one is RC30. It's probably from about mm, late 60s, 1970. Look at that, it was $2.95. What is in here? Well, the circuit that we just looked at is in here. That's the circuit. There's iterations of this going back years and years. And the very first version used the 6SL7 tube, not the 12AX7. And we're going to look at the circuit in a second. The great thing about these manuals is they give a description of the circuit. The whole thing has been hopefully tested, but it's certainly well documented, so you can duplicate the circuit. But these manuals were mostly about describing the tubes, particularly the new tubes that were coming out. And new tubes were coming out every year, so these manuals were published every year. And at the very beginning of these manuals, there's descriptions on how tubes operate, circuit design, and they're just totally cool. I mean, they're just filled with a wealth of information. So that's a fairly new manual, near the end of the uh, second tube era. And this is a really old one in beautiful condition. This is RC14. So this probably dates from the late 30s. And look at how much it was, 35 cents. And it's the same basic thing, and it's got the same sort of information. They all follow the same format, but around the time of a new invention uh, of radio, FM radio, um, TV, these technical sections, of course, would change to reflect the, the technology of that year. And um, they're well worth seeking them out, and you can actually find them as PDFs online. Anyways. So that's the source of this. Let's take a quick look at this. It says type 70252. What the heck is that? Well, that is just a specification for a later version of the 12AX7. And it's supposed to be a low noise designation. But as soon as RCA came out with the designation, everybody out there who made the 12AX7 rebranded theirs. 7025s. <laughs> so it's absolutely meaningless. Maybe the very early 7025s were actually low noise or selected off the line, but just consider a 7025 a 12AX7. Okay, how does this circuit work? So our signal comes in here. 12AX7, of course, is a high mu or high gain twin triode, so it's got a nominal gain of 100 per side. We amplify in the first stage and we couple through a cap here and then we hit the, the equalization circuit. So here it is. It's a passive circuit. Now passive just means that it is a brute force circuit applied to the signal. There's no feedback. And here it is right here, R6, C6, R10, and C7. This is the equalization circuit and the equalization is connected up to ground. And here's our signal. It passes through R6 and here's our, the input of the second tube or the second stage of the 12AX7. We have now our signal has been equalized, yeah? So it should be flat. It comes onto the grid of the second stage. It gets amplified out it goes, it goes through a coupling cap, and it's on its merry way. Now, this simple circuit was designed as a component circuit, so it was meant to go with another amplifier that would be immediately adjacent to it, because it's got 220,000 ohms of output impedance, <laughs> which is huge, <laughs> 220k. So it needs a cathode follower or it needs to be immediately adjacent, so the wire connecting up to the next stage might be an inch long or something like that, or a trace on a circuit board. Okay, so that's a passive equalization circuit, very common one. Let's look at a very common active circuit. Now this is um, 
a Chinese knockoff of a famous um, active circuit, the EA, EAR-834. And I don't know if it's exactly the same circuit, but we're just using it as a demonstration, so it doesn't really matter. This took the audio world by storm, this active circuit. Before uh, the EAR came out, E, e and A just stand for esoteric audio. And um, the, the designer of that company is, is, is definitely brilliant. But before this came out, of course, there were other active circuits. The Marantz 7, which is a famous, famous preamp. Saul Marantz did a very similar circuit with an active feedback loop. So let's look at how this works quickly. So we're again, we're using 12AX7s. You may have noticed there's another tube added to the circuit, and we'll talk about that in a second. So in comes the signal, we amplify it, we come through a coupling cap, we land on top of the grid of the second stage, we amplify it again. Remember, the signal coming off of a, a stylus moving in a record groove is extremely low. It'll be a nominal 5 millivolts, let's say. So a millivolt is 1 thousandths of a volt. So that would be five one thousandths of a volt. <laughs> to put that in perspective, a nominal output of a CD player is two full volts or 2,000 millivolts. So the signal is really low. So it's not surprising we need two stages of gain and we need two high gain stages. So the 12AX7 fits the bill for that. So off we come. We've got two gain stages. We come through here, we couple through a capacitor. That just deals with the high voltage, right? That's DC on the plate. Coupling capacitors block high voltage DC and allow the audio signal to go through. So our audio signal passes through the coupling capacitor. It's AC only on this side, high voltage DC on this side. It comes through here and it goes into a CF stage or cathode follower. And we take the signal off of the cathode. It's low impedance now. And through a coupling cap, and out we go. But on the way, something interesting happened. We picked up the signal here. We tagged it. We fed it back. Ah, and what is this? This is an EQ circuit. And we, in this case, the designer chose to feed it back here, in between the two stages. And we apply the EQ here, and the signal now coming into the second stage of gain is, should be flat, or as close to it as we can get. Because as I mentioned, it's never perfect. But close is good enough. One of the things about uh, listening to vinyl or records is that we're not really concerned about perfection, are we? What we're concerned about is a great listening experience. Something you can get from vinyl, records, um, high quality tape, and really high resolution um, digital that has been well handled from beginning to end, just like vinyl, um, can give us that really dynamic, live sounding um, end product that we're looking for. That the Nirvana experience, glorious, glorious music, which is what we're all about. Yes, we love tubes and we love selling tubes, but we're really in it for the music. <laughs> okay, so we've looked at passive, we've looked at active circuits, and hopefully that gets you a little bit more oriented as to what we'll be talking about over the coming weeks because there's another um, kit preamp in production. Well, it's not in production, it's in development. Okay. All right. And also, everybody should be aware that there's so many different ways of doing this equalization circuit, and we're going to be experimenting to figure out which one we like the best and which one sounds the best. That's right. I mean, we're just looking at um, at vacuum tube, a pure vacuum tube uh, circuit. Mm -hmm. uh, Even in that case, though, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. So if you're interested in experimenting with it, uh, there's lots of resources out there, and we're going to be taking a look at it ourselves. Right, and the vast majority of phono stages these days are just strictly solid state, but a lot of them are actually hybrids in which they have, uh, they'll have a, 
a, a section that is solid state and a section that is tube. And I guess they're trying to achieve the best of both worlds. Okay. All right. So what's going on over at Mellotone Kits? Well, let me clear the decks here for you. <laughs> well, we've been busy shipping GU50 monoblocks and we've got two left for test builders. Then we're sold out until we release them to the general public. We were just talking about phono preamps, so not surprisingly, prototype number two kit phono preamp is being designed and built. Let's take a quick look at it here. Oh, let's back it out, Charles. Yeah, it's a little too much for the camera. It's not that big a preamp. So there is the top of the plate. There isn't a whole lot to look at there. So let's flip it on over and take a look at what's going on in behind. And you've been the lead on this. Can you tell us a little bit about this circuit, Dad? Yeah, this is this is actually prototype number two. Um, two Christmases ago, I built prototype number one. I love building an app between Christmas and New Year's. It's a quiet time in the shop, and uh, there's usually not very many orders. There's not e I get emails all day long, every day of the week, so the, even the emails slow down. So I can focus and build, build, build. Um, so anyways, um, this is gonna be another dual mono preamp design. Once you've heard dual mono preamps, you'll never want anything else. When you separate the power supplies, uh, you end up with an amazing amount of stereo separation, a great improvement. As a result, you get an, a great sound stage. Instruments, vocals, they have position, they have depth. This is, to me, this is absolutely just a no-brainer. It adds some complexity to the build and a little bit of cost, but it really, in my opinion, is worth it. So you've got two power supply boards as a result, of course. All you can see here that's finished is the cathode follower stage, and we were just looking at that. So this is actually the end of the of the circuit. From here, we'll come out to the RCA jacks out. Over here, we're going to have a, a a left preamp board with EQ circuit, so gain and and EQ, and here we'll have the right circuit. And the boards will just, this is going to be a fairly complex circuit. Not overly complex. We can fit the whole thing on a board, but it's going to be fairly complex. So using point-to-point -point wiring between boards and between the large caps is a good way of dealing with high voltage. And then using the printed circuit boards to handle the, the more tricky circuits is just, it's fabulous. I mean, even though I'm building almost every day of the week, and Charles is as well, when we have to do prototype work and we have a board to work with, oh my God, it speeds up the work so much. So you can imagine if you're a kit builder, how much easier it is to build a small board versus doing point-to-point -point wiring. And because Charles designs these boards so beautifully, they're re electrically, there's just not going to be any difference. So we're going to... We're going to build some basic circuit ideas that we've got. We've got some variations on a traditional, the traditional theme of how to equalize the circuit. But our ultimate goal is we want to use vintage tubes that are available. So this is going to be based on the 12SL7 as the gain stage. we will use the 12SN7 as the follower. But... It'll be a universal design, so it's going to be able to use the... What, it, what, it, it can the, use the 6SL7, yep. uh, the 12SL7, of course, and the 7F7. The Loctal equivalent. Yeah, the 7F7 and the 14F7, which are the 6 and 12 volt versions of those tubes. And there's a few other varieties out there, some variations on the 6SL7 that it can play as well. And of course, in the cathode follower 6SN7 stage, it's going to have all the familiar options that we have in our universal preamp already. Right. And of course, the whole point of using these tubes is that the high, very high demand premium 6SL7s and 6SN7s are getting harder to find. They're inc getting incredibly expensive. But the 12 volt version, the 12 SL7 and the 12 SN7 and the Loctal equivalents, man, I mean, I can, we can still find them, new old stock, new in the box, going all the way back to the early 1940s. And they are literally the same tubes, but with different heaters. That's it. Yeah. So, and what makes this universal is the switch mode power supply that powers up the filaments. 
So you can either put a 6 volt supply on or a 12 volt. It's as simple as that. And our most popular kit to date has been the Universal 6 or 12 SN7 preamp. It's an amazing sounding preamp, so it's not surprising a lot of people want it. And the universality means that they can buy premium 12 volt tubes. You for, can find premium 12 volt tubes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, they're not free, but they are a heck of a lot cheaper than the 6 volt equivalents. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to drop in on this design as it moves forward. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's Technically, it's a bit challenging because of the... Uh, the EQ circuit that's required, but Charles is a, just brilliant with uh, plotting this, the the ins and the outs of this thing digitally, and he's he's he, he really has a handle on doing the technical side of this. So I'm just going to be the builder. He's going to be the <laughs> yeah. You're going to be the en chief engineer, I think. I'll try chief. to be, but I'm looking forward to spinning up a whole lot of uh, vinyl and uh, seeing how it sounds on it once we get it sorted out. Yeah, okay, well, this is going to be fun. It has right. been fun so far. Okay, now, for weeks, we've been saying that stuff is coming, stuff is coming, and nothing has been showing up. Well, everything seems to be coming at once. Other than stuff that's stuck in customs, and it's going to require some serious prying to get it out of their greedy little hands, a lot of really premium stuff has come in. So, let's just get it all organized here so we can look at it. Okay, Charles, you want to run everybody through what we've got? <laughs> we've got quite a variety here. All right, so these ones everybody should already be familiar with. We've got some great Mullard EL34 XF2s. Let me get that on camera there. This one in particular is branded HP. Now, you know there's a lot of rebranding on these tubes, but these date codes don't lie right here. This one's actually upside down, but you can see, let's see if you can get that on camera, XF2 right there. So we've got a nice discount quad of these in, and they, I think they're in the store already here. Yeah, they are. I mean, the, it's an interesting discount quad because if you want to know how old your power tube is, a really good indicator is how much chrome does it have. Well, these all have really great chrome. No signs that they've ever had a lot of hours on them. But they, my rule is I like to sell premium sets of, well, any set of power tube, I'd like to see them at 20 milliamps or over. And these ones are right on the edge. They're right on the edge. They could be premium priced, but they're just on the edge. And I, we just don't sell sets like this, premium sets for full price, unless they, they're testing nice and high and strong. So this is heavily discounted. We only have one set in the store. It's heavily discounted. So there, I know they're still discounted, they're still expensive, but, here's the big but, you can apply a discount code at the end and save even more money. So, they don't last long. The last discount set we sold, the buyer sent me two letters thanking me how much he liked the sound. I mean, this is the, there are other EL34s that sound great, but nothing sounds like a Mullard XF2. So nothing. this is a great chance to own some if you've been waiting for a bit. Yep. We have another EL34 sitting over here too, and this is actually something that just came in. This is an RFT. And how do you spot an RFT? Well, they typically have these dimples on the top of the glass. And... The dead giveaway. The dead giveaway, if you look... Oh, let me get that right on camera there, see if I can get it in focus. If you look at the pin base, they have this little raised plastic divot right around the pin. All the RFTs have this, I believe. Except for the very early years, and they're quite rare. You don't see too many of those. This is a nice new old stock example here. and We've, we've uh, just gotten in a bunch of used and new examples, I believe. Well, I think more than a bunch. Yeah. It was a big box. So we're going to have some quads in the store soon of these tubes right here. So keep your eyes open for them. Yeah, and the thing about the RFT uh, is that the RFT was was liked by so many um, two, two companies that didn't have an EL34 that companies like Siemens that of course are famous in Germany for high quality tubes they rebranded all of their EL34s for years not the early early EL34s but for years they bought RFT tubes and had them rebranded re with Siemens label on them. Well, you can tell they like premium tubes. Here's some rebranded Mullard. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they would do. 
And of course it made sense for Siemens that was in West Germany at the time and RFT which was in the DDR, which was um, the former East Germany, right? So the thing about the RFTs that makes them really unique among EL34s is the level of detail. The Mullards do everything really well. They have great detail. They have this mid-range that people call people make an analogy that it's like listening to liquid gold. Well, how can you listen to liquid gold? And I think, <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's a bit of an exaggeration, but the mid-range of the Mullards are, is just truly astonishing. But the RFTs are, I would say, a fairly close second place. They don't have that amazing mid-range range warmth, but what they do replace it with is detail. The detail of the RFTs is probably among the best of any EL34 made. And even though a lot of people that are into tubes think of themselves more as a warm tube person, when they've heard an extremely good tube that does excellent detail, they may well decide, as one of our customers did, Jim, I thought I was a warm tube guy, but now that I've heard in this case, he heard the tongue saw is another great tube for detail. He said, I think I'm a detailed guy. <laughs> and the truth is, I like them I like them well, both. They, they all do a great job just in their own ways. And um, personally, I, I think they're both amazing sounding. I could take one or the other either, any day. Okay, Charles. What else do we have here? Well, we have some tongue saws. Let's see if I can get it out of the box for you. Hopefully without damage. This is the highest demand tube we have. Nothing else sells faster than these. Don't drop it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the standard tongue saw 6SN7 GTP. Oh, let me get that on camera. It's a t Typically we call it a tall boy. Yeah, it's a tall boy. They have the classic angled T-plates. And uh, I talked about this before, but you can really tell the difference with the tongues because they have sharper edges on those plates compared to something like a Sylvania or a CBS tube. And the and micas are pretty they have close. they have these spiky micas and yeah. the tongue was the only one that did this with them so it's easy to spot them a mile away yeah there are some other 6s n 7s that had the spiky micas but nothing quite like the tongues they, they don't look the same yeah so these are amazing sounding tubes and I, we just can't keep these in the store and it's probably our most expensive 6s n 7 now this just came in charles yeah let's see if we can get these and, out of the box and did this ever catch your eye we should take a quick look at the box here, too, after we get it out. Ready to catch? <laughs> there we go. All right, well, let's take a quick look at the box here. So we see a lot of boxes, obviously. And, you know, right off the bat, this looks like a standard RCA box. But what caught our eye is just how crisp and new this box looks. It looks like this just came off of a production line or... You know, maybe it was sealed in something because it looks like it was just made. Now, sometimes you got to be careful. When you see a box coming in like this, it could well be... A reproduction. A reproduction box. And my rule for reproduction boxes is if somebody is selling a tube in a repo box, stay away. Run. <laughs> yeah. Because it raises red flags right away. We've had some terrible experiences with sellers that have done... Uh, repo boxes. It's a really good indicator that somebody is trying to sell something that, that is not real. But on in this, in this case, case, take a look at what was inside of it here. We've got this absolutely beautiful new old stock RCA 12AU7A. And this is the clear top version, of course. So show the side getter. It's really yeah, quite so neat. So let me see if I can get that. It's right underneath the text here. There it is. It's hard yeah. to see. So these are the clear tops, and these are widely regarded as being one of the best sounding American-made 12AU7 tubes. And, and the interesting thing is that, that they've been rock solid, haven't they? they? They've tested extraordinarily well, both new and used old stock. So we just got a whole bunch of these in, and they're going to be in the store soon. Okay. Well, thanks for doing that, Charles. Let's get these out of here safely. <laughs> I think Charles spent an hour just unboxing this afternoon so that we could show some of these tubes. Well, if you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Now, we've got $20 flat rate shipping around the world, and we can reach most places for that. But if your order is $150 or more, 
after discount the shipping's on us folks and of course you can use any of these cheers codes to save some money and there is a secret code it's easy to figure out if you watch the way these codes sort of yeah okay you yeah. got it no and more I'll... hints we're <laughs> cost us a lot of money over the course of a year and if anybody's looking for a gift for somebody in their life that likes tube gear or tubes we've got gift cards in the store as well for the christmas season well, that's right last year we actually had a good customer um he told his whole family that he said, "All I want is one of one of uh, one of Melaton Kit's uh, preamps. I think is what he built." Mm -hmm. And his whole family gave him gift certificates from the store, and and then he jumped in and uh, he was able to buy what he wanted for Christmas. And uh, because we shipped the kits express, we actually can still get a kit out before Christmas. Believe it or not. That's cutting it close, though. <laughs> yeah, well, in a few days, it'll we'll have probably hit the cutoff. But I think we just shipped one with nine days, so that would be the 18th. Mm -hmm. Okay. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>